Testing. Just testing this microphone. Yeah. Uh, mic test. Sounds like it works. Is, can you guys hear me in the back? Joe? Well, my name is Matt. I'm the senior pastor here at Oak Chapel. I want to say thank you for everybody coming here. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is a soft start. If you wouldn't mind, turn to somebody near it, and it could be someone you came with or someone you don't know. And I'd just like you to introduce yourself, who you are, and say what you're hoping to gain from either our friendship or this particular event. I'm John. It's a Jolene? Probably. By the time you're done, <laughs> it should feel real cooled off. And I think we can attribute it to Dan's presentation. Wasn't that refreshing? Yeah. 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 Physically, yes, that was refreshing. I feel good. I want to say thank you to everybody who's here. Um, we're not trying to sweat you out. <clears throat> thank you for your time. Uh, I understand that many of us are coming from different places. Just a big picture, Rabbi Dan approached Hope Chapel 
And so we'll give him the credit for the good ideas that the partnership produces. But in picture, we're, lo we're looking for a friendship between uh, the Jewish community and the Christian community or any, anyone else who's willing to bestow friendship. And um, I'd like to say that we want to pursue this, not necessarily with uh, perfection in mind, because it's a lot, that's really, it's a lot of expectation, maybe too much stress. But we want to pursue friendship in a way that's governed by love. And that's going to require honesty and integrity and the giving of ourselves. So what Dan's going to do, practically speaking, you're about to experience, he's going to speak to us both from Genesis and from his perspective on the way Jews are treated in the world uh, and uh, a few other things in particular from a perspective of someone living in America. We want to bless our Jewish neighbors. Amen. Amen. And uh, Rabbi Dan is not going to pretend to be Christian. He's going he's gonna to embrace his Jewish perspective. And the Christians in the room don't have to pretend to be Jewish. You can pray in Jesus' name. Rabbi Dan knows where he is. He's a smart man. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, is, it is cool to go into somebody else's uh, place of worship and uh, extend friendship. So his perspective doesn't have to be yours. Yours doesn't have to be his. What we're trying to build is a friendship from genuine places of integrity. After his presentation, um, he's going to entertain questions. We'll do questions and answers. Um, I already told him earlier, I'm going to attempt to go first and ask something dumb to lower the bar. <laughs> It's really, it's fine. You can ask Dan anything you want. I've asked him a lot of dumb questions already, just the two of us, before this event started. And he does great. You don't have to worry about throwing him a curveball. He can handle it. So I'm going to open with a prayer. Oh, and then after Q&A, I thought it would be cool if we had a small time of prayer, we blessed our Jewish neighbors. Um, so we'll have a small set of volunteers praying for Tiferet Israel, his congregation, our Jewish neighbors in general, and then maybe praying for those who harbor anti-Semitism. So we'll choose several different topics and we'll take volunteers to lead out. And then we'll ask Rabbi Dan to bless us. Yes. So I think that would be a good first step. Uh, some of you probably know I'm going to be invited to go to Tiferet to do something similar. I'll probably bring some of y'all. Depends how well you behave tonight. But <laughs> so without further ado, I'm just going to have an opening prayer, and then we'll, we'll give Rabbi Dan the floor. So Father, thank you for everyone gathered here. We ask for your joy, and for your peace, and for your favor, um, and your wisdom as, uh, as we pursue relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's welcome Rabbi Dan. Pastor Matt, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here this evening. I know that many of you have traveled from far and wide to be here, so I hope I, I bring the goods. Um, so my name is Dan Milner. I'm the rabbi of Congregation Tiferet Israel, which is right here in Austin on the Dell Jewish Community Campus. It's an Orthodox synagogue. I'm an Orthodox rabbi. And I've been here for about 10 years. Uh, in addition to my work in the synagogue, full-time work in the synagogue, I'm also a chaplain uh, in the, in the uh, Air National Guard. Um, so I wear a couple of different hats. I'm here tonight because something has happened in the world that we need to be very aware of and very sensitive to. On October 7th of 2023, as we know, Hamas terrorists came into Israel and they murdered over 1,200 people. And there are over 120, 130 captives still remaining in Hamas's hands. And when that happened, not just the Jewish world, but the world woke up to two things. The first thing that we realized was that the state of Israel is not invincible. And we also learned that the threats of our enemies are not just bluster, they are horrifyingly real. And that's who's living in that neighborhood. That's your neighbor. We also learned 
that it takes about a nanosecond for people to turn sympathy for the Jewish people into hatred for the Jewish people. And how quickly did that sympathy dissipate? Even before Israel had launched any retaliatory strikes in Gaza, there were people, for example, for example, by the Sydney Opera House chanting, gas the Jews. This is reality in 2023 and 2024. And we watched this happen, and the Jewish community were stunned, saddened, and scared. And many of us looked around to see where our friends were, to see where our allies were. And sadly, we didn't see a whole lot of hands being raised. And so I'm here tonight because I know and you know that that's not true. That the Jewish people do have friends, they do have allies, and we all want to be a part of advancing the story of the Jewish people and the friends of the Jewish people in order to achieve a collective and unified purpose and mission in God's plan. And so what happened was, after October 7th, I would be walking around different places. I was in Alabama on an Air Force training. Somebody in the grocery store said, you know, I'm wearing a kippah. It's not the most common thing in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> I don't think about it. The, the, the uh, checkout clerk goes, are you Jewish? I say, no. No, I just Depends. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> I say, yes, I am. And the clerk says, I'm praying for Israel. I go to the Mac store here, buy a new computer. And uh, the person who's working with me to find the right you know, machine and all that, computer, says, are you Jewish? I say, yeah, I'm praying for Israel. And this started to happen pretty regularly. And finally, it got to the point where the last person who asked me, are you Jewish? I'm praying for Israel. I said to that person, who are you praying for Israel with? Who is praying with you? Is it just you and you're alone? Is it with your church? Does your pastor talk about these things? And before long, I noticed that there were a lot of people walking around feeling this great burden on them that they were praying for the Jewish people but didn't feel like they had a network. They didn't feel like they had a place to posit those feelings and to do something productive with them, to translate the prayer into action. And what did I do? I picked up the phone. I called. Where is he? I called Bob Odell. <laughs> so I said, Bob, you have to help me because I think I have an idea. And sure enough, we got a group of people together, wonderful people, Bob, Oda Bob Odell, Thomas Coggill, and, a and his wife, Amy Coggill, and uh, Clinton Scroggins, Sandra Pedrati, and Rick Randall. And we came together thinking of creating an organization that would be an apolitical organization, a place that people could come based on their faith as Jews and as Christians to show their support for Israel and to combat anti-Semitism. The name of that organization that we're beginning now is called Faith of Friends. We'll learn a little bit more about it, but that's what we're thinking of doing here. And part of what we want to do is go into each other's spaces and help educate. So I'm here this evening to talk a little bit about what this is all about, Genesis 12.3. Pastor Matt is going to come into our space to talk a little bit about what is the Christian position on all of these things. We'd like to know. We'd like to work together as brothers and sisters in support of the Jewish people and in support of Israel. And so... By doing that, I think that we can arm ourselves with knowledge, with facts, so that we can feel confident in our opinions, that we can feel unafraid when we show up to things and people are yelling in our faces and trying to intimidate us. We can know who we are. So that's what this is all about, and I'm hoping that we can achieve some of that this evening. So that's the long introduction. 
Now, throughout the course of the uh, presentation, uh, there'll be time for some back and forth and everything like that, so it's not going to be totally frontal. So um, I'm not going to ask if there are any questions right now, but let's get started. You want to get started? Sure. All right, let's do it. So what we're going to talk about today is Genesis 12.3. Everybody heard of Genesis 12.3? Okay. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who bless you, I will bless. What is that a promise, a command, or a threat? Very interesting. Let's see. Let's take a look. If you want to understand Genesis 12.3, you've got to understand Genesis 12.2. Here God is speaking to Abraham, at that time just named Abram. And he says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and curse the one who curses you. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Now, if you'll notice, I color-coded this. That's the extent of my tech abilities. <laughs> because there's actually three sections, right? The first section, who's that speaking to? I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. Who's that? Who, God speaking to who? Abraham. Abraham. Then, I will bless those who bless you and curse the one who curses you. Who's that speaking about now? Everybody. Everybody, other people, we're moving on. And then we have all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. So we have three different sections here that we got to take apart a little bit. So the first question I want to ask is what is the nature of these verses? What is that? When you hear those words, I will bless those who bless you and curse the one who curses you, how do you interpret that? These are questions. You can raise your hand. How do you interpret that? Is that a commandment? If it's a commandment, then I don't hear any thou shalts. And what is that? Is that a problem? What is that? Yeah. Statement of, fact. Statement of fact. This is the way that it is. This is how the world is going to work. We see numerous examples of this throughout the Bible where God will say something. It's not a commandment. He's just saying this is the way it's going to be. Man shall eat his bread by the sweat of his brow. I had a sandwich today. I didn't, you know, cut, you know break a sweat. He's just saying, that's the way that it is. If you can improve it, good for you. <laughs> There's no commandment that you have to go out there if you want to, make a, if you want to have a sandwich. You've got to get the bread all your, you know. Okay, good. So, statement of fact. Any other thoughts on that? All right, I like it. We talked about who is being spoken to. Now let's get to the next part, the meat of it. What does blessing mean here? What does cursing actually mean? Say, I want to bless the Jewish people. What does that mean? Give them something good. Give them something good, which means what? Like, phys physically give something good? Like to, to physically give them resources, things like that? Okay. Spiritually. Spiritually. Make them happy. Make them happy. Any other thoughts? Favor. Favor. Who said that? Yeah. Favor. And what do we mean by that? Hope for the best for them. Okay, great. Absolutely. To, to bless is to be fruitful, multiply. Great. And fill. Beautiful. Okay. What about what about the curses? Those who curse you, the one who curses you, I will curse. What is a curse? It doesn't sound good. You could say it's the opposite of everything you said, right? <laughs> but may, is it anything more than that? The negative proclamation of doom. Okay certainly seems to put you not on God's side. Okay, okay. so you're, you, you would not be on God's side if you go against, sounds like you're going against Abraham. Okay, and then the big question is, how do you do that then? All the stuff that was just said here. Blessing, fruitful and multiple, how, how do we do it, right? <clears throat> Curses, how do I not get that? I don't want that. <laughs> so how do I avoid that thing? It's very interesting. It's telling me something, and it's like, okay, so can you tell me how? No, I'm just telling, I'm just saying, this is the fact. So I gotta figure that out. That's very tricky. Puts us all in a very awkward situation. So let's see if we can find out. So the first place we have to start is even further back in Genesis 12, 1. We have to talk about Abraham. Who was Abraham? Abraham 
the first ethical monotheist, the Jewish traditions understood as the first Jew. Who was he? Why is he so significant? It says there, and the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Right, everybody familiar with this? This is Abraham going off on his journey. It's the first time God speaks to Abraham in the Bible, and all he says is, Lech Lecha, go. I'm not going to tell you where to go. He has no idea where he's going. It's GPS, right? <laughs> it's the God positioning system. You just you go, right? Tell you go. He's just, okay, I'm just going to go. Now, what do we make of that? What do we make of a person who does something like that? If I gave you keys to a car and I said, just, just go that way <laughs> until what? Where, just, just go. Probably, you know not be that. Uh, but Abraham doesn't. And what does this mean? I want to take a look here. This is a commentary from Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, who's a very important uh, Jewish commentator. We're going to see his name come up a whole bunch of times here. He uh, lived in Germany in the 1800s, uh, died in 1808, uh, sorry, 1888 rather, um, and became the father of what would become modern Orthodox Judaism. Uh, and he says as follows, he says, this was the attitude demanded of Abraham at the starting point for his own mission, and that of the nation that was to descend from him. See, that's the key. When we talk about Abraham, we're not just talking about the man Abraham. When we invoke the name Abraham, who are we also talking about? We are talking about his descendants. Because all of the promises that God is making to Abraham, yes, they would happen in his lifetime, but often it's speaking about the progeny. It's speaking about the descendants. It's speaking about the nation that is to arise after him. So here what he's saying is that what we find here is not only the starting point for his mission in life, his actual Abraham mission to go to the land that I will show you, but we're also talking about something that's going to be inherited by his descendants. And what is that? The courage to be a minority. The courage to be a minority. Was Abraham's first stand in keeping with the spirit of his times in the midst of Chaldea, Babylonia, Assyria, Phoenicia, and ancient Egypt? In those lands, the doctrine of the day was the worship of power and physicality. The Mesopotamians worshipped pleasure, while the ancient Egyptians deified power and stifled personal freedom. Except for a few faint traces, the God idea had almost vanished until Abraham arose and appeared in the world. And when everyone else in the world was seeking to integrate, to establish himself, and win the rights of a citizen, Abraham gave up his homeland and the rights of citizenship. Of his own free will, he became an outsider and openly denied the gods worship by all the nations. Such conduct demands courage and firm belief in the truth of one's inner convictions and one's awareness of God. It demands Jewish awareness, Jewish stubbornness. This was the first trial thrust upon our father Abraham. So what is this telling us, right? Abraham was different. How was Abraham different? Well, everything else that his society wants, that his society is buying into, he's doing the exact opposite. He's rejecting all of that, and he's saying, well, I'm going this way. He could have been very successful in Haran, where he was living. He was very successful. We know that. He was very wealthy. If he had stayed there... He would have been a very respected, very wealthy nobody. Nobody would speak the name of Abraham. Why do we know the name Abraham? Because he decided it's okay and it's the right thing to do to be alone, to go my own way. And that trait that's spoken of here, that willingness to go it alone and to do the thing that God is telling you to do when everyone else around you was saying, go that way, he says, I'm going to go that, that way, that was inherited what Rabbi Hirsch is saying, by his descendants. That trait, Jewish awareness, Jewish stubbornness. You know, they often, you know, they say that the Jewish people are an Am Kishay Oref. They're a stiff-necked people. It's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> now, like I said, that difference in Abraham was inherited by his people, by the Jewish people. How can I show you that? I will show you that also from the Bible. Every, all the texts, everything's all biblical. Everybody remember Genesis 23, 4. Sarah dies. And Abraham does what? He's going to go buy a burial plot for his wife at Marat Machpelah, the cave of Machpelah in, in what is today Hebron. You could go and visit it. And when he's there, if you remember, he's there with the people of Chet. 
And they say, look, we like you. You're a nice guy. Take whatever plot. I'm not, you know, take it. It's yours. But what does Abraham say? No, I'm not going to just take it. I'm going to buy it. I have to buy it. Now, why does he have to buy it? A couple of reasons. One, if they give it to him, they could say, well, we gave it to you, so we're going to take it back. The other thing is they could say, you owe us something. He says, I don't want to owe you anything. I want to have absolute ownership over this plot of land. And so, of course, they charge him through the nose for it, but he pays it. But here it says something very interesting. When he's wanting to bury his wife, he makes the following declaration. He says, I am a resident alien among you. That's how he describes himself. I am a resident alien among you. Sell me a burial site among you that I may remove my dead for burial. Let's talk about resident alien. Ger Toshav. What does he mean by that? Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, here we're going to look at his words here, also a very important rabbi in the modern Orthodox world, passed away in the early 1990s, um, taught at Yeshiva University. And he says, this is what Abraham is, is saying when he says those words. He says, certainly I am a resident. I am one of you. I engage in business as you do. I speak your language. I take full part in your social, economic institutions. But at the same time, I am a stranger and in some aspects, a foreigner. I belong, Abraham says, I belong to a particular world, one that is completely foreign to you. It is a world in which I am at one with the creator. It is a world populated by characters unknown to you, with a tradition that you do not understand and spiritual values that seem impractical in your eyes. It is a world of Torah, of loving kindness, of sanctity and purity. You live differently pray differently, your concept of charity is different from ours, your days of rest are different from ours, and so on. In these matters, I am a stranger in your world, and you are strangers in mine. So when he describes himself as a resident alien, Abraham is trying to communicate, I am like you in all of these things, but there's something particular about me that makes me very different. And that is his commitment to God. And the way that we would look at this is then, of course, the Jewish commitment to God, the laws, the Torah, the things that we do that set us apart, that make us different. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do this? Oh, well, we can't do this because X, Y, and Z, or I can do this because of X, Y, and Z. And some people say, why? That's ridiculous. You can't drive in a car on Saturday. Come on, what are you talking about? How does that work? That's what the Torah says. I'm not going to do it. Seems impractical. Seems foolish. Wait, you can't eat this? You can't eat it. That's right. I can't. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Sounds funny. But that's what Abraham is saying. I am like you, but in my faith, I am very different from you. And that is the Jewish experience. Living among other peoples and becoming a part of their systems, becoming contributors to their societies, leaders in their societies, but being different. There's a story that's told when, uh, when um, uh, I think it was James Rothschild died. Uh, he was French, and he wanted to be buried in Israel. And Charles de Gaulle heard about this, and he was very upset because he wanted Rothschild to be buried in France. And when they told him that Rothschild wanted to be buried in Israel, he said, I always thought that he was a good Frenchman, but I guess I was wrong. Right? I guess he was always a Jew, is what he was communicating there. So what does this mean for us, this difference that's inherited? How do people respond to that difference? Do they like it, or does it irritate people? Do they respect it, or does it really turn them off? And that's the question. Let's look at some biblical responses to Jewish difference, shall we? Well, the first place to start is Exodus. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal, with them. Let us deal shrewdly with them so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us. How would you describe that attitude? What is on Pharaoh's? Pharaoh's not, he's not like, oh, they worship one God, I hate that. He doesn't say anything about that. What's his problem with the Jews? They're prosperous. They're prosperous? Multiplying. Multiplying. They're too, yeah. What, what's his big concern? They have no allegiance to Yes. They, if a war breaks out, these guys are going to be on the other team. Friends, 
That is an ancient anti-Semitic canard that goes all the way back to Pharaoh. <coughs> Dual loyalty. That's interesting. The Jews are not loyal to the state. They're loyal to each other. They're not loyal to America. They're loyal to Israel. All of that. We see it today. And we see it right here in Pharaoh. Pharaoh has a problem with the people. He doesn't trust the people. Their ethnicity makes them different. So all these people ask the question, are Jews a race, a religion? Well, he doesn't, quote, he doesn't have a problem with their religion, seemingly. He will in a little bit, but uh, he doesn't now. <laughs> His problem is with the people. It's a political issue for him, for Pharaoh. Everybody see that? Yeah. <laughs> so that's his response to their difference. They're just different. I don't like that. I don't trust them. Let's go to the next one. Haman, Book of Esther, right? Mm -hmm. Haman said to King Akashverosh, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the other peoples in all the provinces of your realm, whose laws are different from those of any other people, and who do not obey the king's laws. And it is not in your majesty's interest to tolerate them. Now, Pharaoh ne uh, Haman never outright names the Jews, by the way. It's very clever. I mean, Akashverosh had 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. It's like, there's a certain people. OK, it could be anybody, I guess. Why not? <laughs> Esther is Jewish, so what? what? Oh, wait, you want to kill the Jews? OK, no, now it's a problem. <clears throat> what, is, what is Haman's problem with the Jews? A little different from the Pharaohs. What's his problem? Besides his own personal issues with Mordecai, but. And they don't obey the laws. They don't obey the laws. And their laws are different. Now, when he says laws, what does he mean by that? The laws of Persia. Yes. So they are not loyal to your laws, King Ahasuerus. They are loyal to their king. Now, it's very interesting, fun fact. The king of Persia was always called the king of kings. <coughs> Even the Shah, right, was called the king of kings. In Judaism, when we refer to God, we say, Melech Malchei Hamlachim, the king, the king of kings. Because we know that in Persian law, that's how they would refer to their king. So we put God above the Persian king. Uh, and so what he's saying is they are not loyal to you, king, and everyone should be loyal to you. They have their own laws. They follow this God, and that's a problem. And those laws sometimes go against what you say, and they'll follow what this, what this God says and not you. So they're disloyal in that, but they're disloyal not because of their ethnicity per se, because he says there are all these other peoples as well. It's because of what they believe that's kind of a problem. It's what they believe that's kind of a problem. I don't trust their beliefs. That makes them different. So we've seen ethnicity, we've seen belief. Number three, book of Nehemiah. When Sanballat, this is when the Jews have come back from the 70 year exile in Babylonia, they're coming back to Israel and they are trying to rebuild Jerusalem, right? Everybody with me? When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding, this is Nehemiah recounting this, that we were rebuilding the wall, it angered him. And he was extremely vexed. He mocked the Jews, saying in the presence of his brothers in the Sumerian force, what are these miserable Jews doing? Will they restore, offer sacrifice, and finish one day? Can they revive those stones out of the dust heaps, burned as they are? <clears throat> what is Sanbalat's problem with the Jews? That's actually a deeper question, but in terms of what this is, <laughs> what this is saying here. How is it, what's his attitude? He doesn't want them rebuilding. He doesn't want them rebuilding, that's for sure. He's afraid of them. He's afraid of them? Why is he afraid of them? Because they look like they are building the walls, and all his sarcastic comments are designed to... Project. Yeah. Okay, very good. They're threatening his power. They're threatening his power. Yeah, he's got a good deal going. That's right. Is he afraid that they're establishing their own place? Yes. Well... He's not afraid of that so much as he wants the Persians to be afraid of that. So he's going to make some stuff up here. But I think the big thing that we find here is this mocking attitude towards Jewish aspiration. You're telling me that you're going to go to this little place, this plot of dirt in the Middle East, the one place that has no oil in it, and you're going you're gonna to make forests? And you're going to build institutions, and you're going to have the most powerful army in the region, and you're going to uh, have Nobel, Nobel Prize winners, and, 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 and basically make every technology we have possible. You're telling me that? That's what I'm telling you. All right, get out of my, get out of my office. <laughs> Jewish aspiration is often mocked. 
Mm. People laugh at it. It's not possible. You can't do that. Well, Ezekiel says you can do it. Isaiah says you can do it. We have a whole tradition of prophets who say we can do it, and we believe in those things. But sometimes when people don't like that ambition, they come at it like it's a, uh, an affront to them. And the response to that is derision and mocking. Now let's flip it. What about this response to difference? But Ruth, Book of Ruth. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you. She's speaking to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. How does Ruth respond to the difference that she senses in Naomi? She clings to it. She clings to it. Yes. It's that difference that I need in my life. It's what makes you different, that makes you so important, that makes me realize I actually want to be more like you. That's what I want to follow. Would my life be easier if I stayed back in Moab and did my own thing with my sister Orpah? And, you know, yeah, probably. But I'm following you, a widow with no other family that could pro provide a, a, a spouse for me to go live on some relative's uh, farm somewhere and hope that you You're crazy? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. All right, I'm going to go with you. That's one response to difference, being inspired by it, knowing that you have to have it too. And lastly, this is going to sound a little bit the same, but, it, but it's different. This is from 2 Samuel. The context of this is the war between King David and his son uh, Absalom. All right? All good? And King David is about to fight. He doesn't want to fight this war. Why? Because he loves his son. He does not want to fight. But he knows that he has to. And he has a commander with him named Etai. Etai is not Jewish. Etai is from the Philistine city of Gat. And what happens before the battle, King David looks at Etai and he says to him, why should you two go with us? Go back, take your kinsmen with you in true faithfulness, right? That, yeah, this is not your fight. This isn't your war. You, you're not, you, just go back home. You don't have to go through this. You don't have to put your life on the line for this. Life is easier for you if you just go back to Gat. Go there. And what does Etai say to him? As the Lord lives and as my Lord the King lives, wherever my Lord the King may be, there your comrade will be, whether for death or life. It's a little bit different. But what is Etai saying to David here? And of course he goes with him. But what is Etai saying to David here? He's going to stand with him. My loyalty is to you. My loyalty is to you. I'm going to fight with you. It's a little different than what Ruth is saying, which is, I'm going to go with you. I will be a companion to you. Here saying, I'm putting my life down on the line for you. And you know why, King David? Because you have the truth. And I've lived in God. I've lived amongst the Philistines. They ain't got it. <laughs> and I can tell you that I would rather be dead and having had exposure to this truth than to live a thousand years in spiritual slavery and darkness. And that's what you would be sending me back to. I'm not going to do it. So these are a few different responses to Jewish difference. And we see here from a biblical perspective, it's all straight from the Bible, we have derision, mocking, hatred, vexation, and we also have clinging and love and fidelity and unity. And the question is, how has that played out? Now, I'm not going to go through everything because, obviously, it's a lot there. Does everybody know who this guy is? Yes. Okay, this guy is Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray is a gift to the Jews and a gift to the Western world. Um, if you don't know who he is, I highly suggest that you check him out, uh, read some of his books. His last book, The War on the West, is incredible. But he is a very strong supporter of Israel and has been a great advocate for the Jewish people. And I certainly put him in the category of a Ruth or of an Etai. And he writes like this. This is very important to understand how this difference has played out over time. He says, sometimes in the past, people hated Jews for their religion. Then you couldn't hate people for their religion, so people hated the Jews for their race. Then you couldn't hate people for their race anymore, so uh, you could hate the Jews for having and defending the state. This is the eternal challenge for the Jewish people. It's their challenge to be hated for being poor and for being rich. 
for being integrated and for not integrating, for being stateless, and also to be hated for having a state. As Vasily Grossman, who's a great Soviet uh, Jewish author, wrote, in the dead center of his masterpiece, Life and Faith, anti-Semitism is always a means rather than an end. It is a measure of the contradictions yet to be resolved. It is a mirror for the failings of individuals, social structures, and state systems. Tell me what you accuse the Jews of, and I will tell you what you are guilty of. Mm-hmm. What he's saying here is that is, is, it's, it's complex, but if you think about what, it, what he's saying is that whatever it is you're pointing out against the Jews, that's probably your issue that you're projecting. If you have an issue with the Jewish people defending their state, it probably means you have a problem with your own country. And it's very interesting. At pro-Israel rallies, you see a lot of American flags. I have not seen one at a pro-Palestinian rally. Wow. Same thing here with, uh, as he mentions, with religion. If you're attacking the Jews on religious reasons, What's going on in your own institution that's causing that kind of thing? If it's an issue of ethnicity and race, what's happening in your society that's causing that to happen? So that's kind of the breakdown of what, of what Murray is saying here, quoting Grossman. And lastly, think about this. He says, consider this. In every European capital, as well as in America, photographs of the Israeli hostages still in captivity by Hamas have been put up. And in every city outside of Israel, They have been torn down. Think about that for a moment. If someone in London or Paris loses their dog, they will put up a poster asking people to help find them. If even one person in our society went around tearing down such a poster, we would ask what has happened in our society. We would ask why we were producing people so pathological. We would want to find that person and punish them. Yet when the missing are Jewish children or Jewish women or Jewish men, these posters are torn down. So again, pointing to something very real that is happening, and the question is, why are those who are responding to Jewish difference right now responding in this way? Because we're seeing it happen. We can be on the side of Ruth and Etai, or we can be on the side of Pharaoh, we can be on the side of Haman, we can be on the side of Sanballat and countless other anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic characters, both in the Bible and outside of it. But now we get on to, now that we've done that that background, which is really important to understand Genesis 12.3. We're going to get to this. Let's talk about it. God's blessings. Who, what, and how. So we're going to break this down. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. So we already said, who are we talking? This is God talking to Abraham, not just to Abraham, but also by extension, Abraham's descendants. Whenever God is speaking to Abraham, he's also speaking to the descendants as well. I will make of you a great nation. What does that mean? All external conditions and natural circumstances will be against the formation of this nation as it will be plain for all to see that God himself is the creator of Israel. You guys are not going to be like everybody else. The one place in the Middle East without oil, that's where you're going to go. (laughs) The guy who, like, walks away from everything and is an outsider and an alien and all of these things, that's going to be your founder. Other nations, they trace their lineage. Think about the ancient Greeks. Uh, Greeks and the ancient Romans and the ancient Egyptians, where do they always trace their foundation stories? To heroes, to gods, to demigods, to all of these things, right? The Romans went through great pains to do this, to to prove to you why they were authentic, why they didn't just come out of nowhere, but ah, they were the second Troy, and Julius Caesar was really, he was a he was a relative of Aeneas, and 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 and, and that means that he also has God blood in him because of Venus. It's like, okay, we got it, we got it. Where do the Jewish people, where do we trace our story to? A group of slaves that got out of Egypt. And how did did we get out of Egypt? God took took us out of Egypt. That's your foundation story. God and God alone. No other nation on earth that has that story. So the fact that he's saying to him, I will make you a great nation, meaning God, me, I make you a great nation. You don't make yourself a great nation. I take the credit. You got the credit. You take the credit, God. Now, I will bless you. What does that mean? It means that I, God, will personally do it for my honor. 
I want to do this. You're important. You have a job. I want to bless you. I will make your name great. Now, you have to pay attention to this. Now, Hirsch says, God can bless people and nations. God is capable of infinite blessing. He can hand them out no problem. I promise you. But he can only wish that they will attain moral virtue and that their deeds will be exemplary. For that depends on the faithfulness of the divine law. God is saying, I want to make you a great nation. But I can't make you a great nation. I can't force that. I can set all the conditions out there. But you have to make yourself a great nation. You have to take all of the things that I've given you, the commandments that I've given you, the morals that I've given you, the way of life that I expect you to live. You have to do that. And when you do that, the human being, you make yourself, your name great. That's what he's saying. God is saying, I wish to make your name great, but you have to do it. You have to make that happen. And lastly, and you shall be a blessing, God blessed Abraham with becoming the one who would preach monotheism, including awareness to the, of the benevolence of God, which he extends to all of his creations. Now, that's going to be really important. What does it mean here that you will be a blessing? It's going to be more than just your people. It's going to have a much wider impact but it's gonna come through you. And lastly, I wish to make your name great, therefore you become a blessing. I wish to make of you a nation that will be a beacon to the nations, a nation to which the others need only look in order to become aware of their own tasks. What's this saying? God is saying, Abraham, this isn't just about you, and it's not just about your descendants. This blessing is about all of the nations of the world. But here's the problem. Here's the issue. How do the nations of the world get those blessings? They get the blessings through the descendants of Abraham. But if the descendants of Abraham are not acting properly, then the nations do not get the blessings because they're saying, look at what these people are doing. Why would I want to do that? So it's a great responsibility, not just on Abraham, but on the Jewish people. You have to be doing what God is telling you to do, because there's much more at stake than just yourself. The nations of the world are depending on you in order to draw close to God and get those blessings as well. And that comes through Abraham's example and the example of the Jewish people. Going back to what I said earlier, I wish to make your name great. You have to make that happen. And if you make that happen, not through divine intervention, you doing it by doing what I'm telling you to do, you bring redemption. So let's talk about the partnership and blessing then that occurs as a result of this. Abraham becomes the conduit through which both the Jewish people and the nations of the world receive blessings. He's the linchpin. The blessings to Abraham and his descendants are unconditional. Right? When God says, I will bless you, I will make your name great, that's unconditional. God doesn't say only if, when, what. No, I'm, I'm going to do that. Statement of fact. It's there. But, but it exists only in potential. It's real, but it exists only in potential. The people themselves must act morally and in accordance with God's will in order to realize them. So they're there, but we have to be acting upon that. The ability of the nations of the world to receive those blessings comes from their connection to the Jewish people and the commitment to Abraham's core mission, which is also the core mission of the Jewish people, to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right, in order that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what has been promised to him. So the Jewish people have a twofold responsibility to keep the way of the Lord and also to serve as ambassadors for God to help the nations of the world receive those blessings as well. That's what Isaiah means when he says, a light unto the nation. If you can't see the light, how do you know where you're going? So the Jewish people have to serve that way. Now, the nations of the world also have a responsibility. They also have a responsibility. That responsibility is seek out Abraham. Seek out Abraham and connect. That's the responsibility of the nations of the world. And this looks like it's not working. We're going to switch over to that. Now, this takes us to a very interesting question about the relationship between the Jewish people and the rest of the world, the nations of the world. And that is universalism is actually realized through particularism. It's not the other way around. 
right? Or it's not that, it's all, we love everybody and everybody's, well, there's a pecking order. You, you can't love everybody the same, I mean, this is from a Jewish perspective. There, there are degrees. I love my children in a different way than I love my kids' friends. Sure. You know, and you can just go down the line and start making priorities for yourself. And so we look at that and we say, well, this particularism, this thing that I don't like about Abraham, why is he different? Why are the Jews different? Why do they, always, they do their own thing and they keep their, they, they can't eat this and they can't go there and they do this and they wear that. And they, why do they do that? It's weird. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that why can't they be like us? Well, the us, the big picture, universalistic picture, that's actually realized through particularism. Right? What do they say? When uh, the oxygen level goes down in a plane, put your mask on first, then help somebody else. That's how this works. Put your mask on first, then you help somebody else. So let's see how this works. It says in Zechariah, which should sound familiar to us, thus, the Lord, thus said the Lord of hosts, people and the inhabitants of many cities shall yet come. The inhabitants of one will go to the other and say, let us go and entreat the favor of the Lord. Let us seek the Lord of hosts. I will go too. Then many people and the multitude of nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of God. Thus said the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten people from nations of every tongue will take hold. They will take hold of every Jew by a corner of their cloak and say, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So what's happening here in this story? Well, something big is happening. They're going to the Jewish people and they're saying, We want to go with <coughs> you and understand that God is with you. Now, what is it? What, what, you just walk up to some guy, say, Are you Jewish? Yeah, okay. So take, how, do, how do I know? Like, What's going on here? It's very, it's very weird. So, Rabbi Hirsch explains, here we have the picture of an awakening and preparing for a mighty move in the world toward God, to entreat the favor of God, to obtain his grace, his help. It is a request for salvation. In those future days when 10 men from, among, uh, from different backgrounds representing diverse nations shall come together seeking one firm hold on life. That's what it means to hold on to the Jewish <coughs> person. They're seeking what? One universal foundation for life. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for the truth. And they will grasp the edge of the garment of the Jewish man. The Jew who fulfills the demand of the temple. The Jew who is the product of the house of Jacob. Fulfilling his mission even in exile around the world. The Jewish man is a priest to all men leading them to God. He is the embodiment of the entire nation, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What is it saying? If the Jewish people are doing or fulfilling God's will, they become the ambassadors of God. And anybody who wants access to that divine truth, find one of those people, and they will take you there. But like I said, a lot of it depends, all of it depends on how we act. First of all, people have to seek him out. That's a responsibility. And this other person, the Jewish individual in Zechariah, also has to know exactly where to go because they've been fulfilling this the whole time. So what do I do? Do I have to love every Jewish person? What responsibilities do I have to my fellow Christians? What if I see that the Jewish people are not living up to their spiritual mandate? It's like, off the hook, I guess. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Schwartz cut me off. I guess, uh, I guess I'm good. And then the bigger question is, okay, so how do I make this connection? Okay, like, sounds good. Like, I, I, I want to do that. I like that idea. But how, how, do, how do I actually make this? So we're going to go into, how do you do that then? <coughs> what does that look like? And these are all questions for us to talk about, think about. But let's talk now about the second part of Genesis 12.3, which is 12.3. I will bless those who bless you. I will bless those who bless you. The blessings here are all in the plural. The blessings are in the plural in Hebrew for everybody. You do this, everybody's covered. Everybody gets the blessings. The blessings are in the plural. And it says the Chizkuni, an important rabbinic commentary, He's speaking now to the Jews about other people, where he says, you, Jewish people, must never think that you have no friends in the world who, that you must never think that you, uh, that you have no friends in the world who want to help you. For I love those who love you. Interesting change 
He doesn't say love or hate, but here he does. He says, I love those who love you and hate the people who hate you. In other words, I know that there are people who love you. Jewish people, he's saying, don't ever think that you don't have any friends. You have friends, and your friends are my friends. The people who show you love, I show love to. Those people are out there. Those people exist, is what he's saying to Abraham here. I will bless those who bless you. Blessing the people, now we say, what does it mean to bless the people? I sit in a room alone and I pray. You couldn't do that. Do I study Bible with other people? You could do that too. Prayer helps. Study helps. But here we're speaking about something specific. Blessing the people means action. Blessing means action. Coming to the aid of the Jewish people. Standing up against those who hate the Jewish people. Letting the Jewish people know that you care and are ready to help. That's what blessing the Jewish people means. And it says here, Rabbi Hirsch says, those who bless you and help you, who value your principles and submit to the service of your God, those I will bless. This promise, too, is expressed with a wish. May Israel be deserving of this promise. May they conduct themselves in their dispersion in such a manner that furthering the mean that uh, uh, means that I'm uh, sorry in such a manner that furthering them means furthering the well-being of the nations. If we bless the Jewish people through our support of the Jewish people, we help the Jewish people get further in their spiritual progress. And what does that mean for the Jewish friend for the non-Jewish friends of the world? It's moving them up the ladder as well. It's helping them as well. Everybody benefits from these blessings. So that's the blessings, helping the Jewish people. What about the curses? What does that mean? So the Hebrew is umikalalecha aor. It uses different language for curses here. Unlike the first one of the blessing is all the same language, here the curses are different. I will curse the one who curses you. The curses are in the singular. They're not in the plural. Because God's not saying, oh, this guy, this guy doesn't like the Jews. I guess all of you were no good. No. I go after the individuals that don't support the Jewish people. Now, if an entire nation falls into that category, it's a different story. But what we're seeing here is that the curses land on the individual, not on the plurality, whereas blessings can be shared by everybody. Now, there's a difference here because mikalalecha and aor. Sounds different to people, right? Why? Klala means to reduce something or someone materially. It comes from the word kal, which means to make somebody lighter, make something lighter. That's outwardly directed. So the first part is, I will curse you, means I am going to materially reduce you. Materially, it's outwardly directed. <coughs> aor, aor means to isolate something or someone to not only reduce materially, but to deplete strength and sap inner vitality. Wow. It's inwardly directed. Thus, I will materially diminish and spiritually diminished. So you get two for one. That's why those two words are used there. They're different. These two things are going to happen. Material diminishment and spiritual diminishment. Now, what's the problem with spiritual diminishment? Can't get the blessings. You keep digging yourself deeper and deeper into this hole. It's not going to be good. And here, Rabbi Hirsch says, God tells Abraham, I will go with you into exile. I will bless each nation in accordance with the respect it gives to the Jewish spirit. No nation will be able to deprive your descendants of their inner vitality. Meaning, the blessings are always there, Abraham. You will always have that inner vitality. You're an eternal people. Never going to take that away from you. Romans, not so eternal. Persians, not so eternal. Greeks, not so eternal. Babylonians, not so eternal. Assyrians, not so eternal. And the list goes on. That's the difference. If you ever wondered about it, that's the difference. It's interesting. But the nations will be able to oppress your descendants, restrict the conditions of their existence, and deprive them of the means of their development. They will hurt you. They will oppress you. They will persecute you. Those nations, not just I will reduce materially, but I will deprive them of the inner vitality necessary for their own development. That's what's going to happen to them. And if you go down the line in history, that is exactly what has happened. Thus the nations will not flourish if they stand in your way to hinder you or do not respect your principles and do not aid your development. It goes without saying then that all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. The more respect they give to your principles, the greater the blessing they will receive. 
But God promises Abraham that ultimately, they will all ultimately base their lives on the foundation on which your life is based. Ultimately, everyone will have that opportunity. It's very interesting, going off script here, but the word or comes from the word or in Hebrew, which means light. light. What does this mean? Uh, those who bless you, uh, those who curse you, I will make light, like bring to light. That's right. I'm going to bring you to light. Uh, you're cursing the Jews. I'm going to show you the error of your ways. You're going to figure out that that was the wrong idea. I want you to repent. That's what perhaps is going on here as well. And in that way, all the people are able to receive those blessings. Well, let's get to the very last piece. Blessings for all. It's good. And all the families of the earth will be blessed by you. The, word, the root of the word, benibarachu, which means to bless, comes, uh, is the same as that of mabrich, which means to graft. The word blessing and the word graft come from the same root in Hebrew. Did you know that? The nations, listen to this, the nations that bless you will be considered to have Abraham's blood in their veins. They will be grafted into Abraham. All the families of the earth will be blessed by you. They will become one family. And that's why I say here, if you feel pained by the hatred hurled against the Jewish people, and you're like, why does this bother me so much? There's so many horrible things in the world, but there's, some, there's something about this that really gets me. You know why? Because it means that you feel that pain is directed against you. Because your blood is Abraham's. An attack against the Jewish people is an attack against you. If you feel this pain, that means that you have made the connection that I'm talking about. You have made the connection, you have tapped into the blessings, but now you have to bless the people through action. If you feel that way, then you know you're on that level. I have made that connection. I have tapped into the blessing. Now what is my responsibility? Those who bless you, I will bless. I have to bless the people. How do I do that? <clears throat> I have to act. I have to stand to support and aid the Jewish people. So what do you do? You gotta stand up against anti-Semitism got to stand with Israel. <clears throat> you got to denounce anti-Semitic rhetoric and actions. You know why? Because it's you. It involves you too. It's not just a Jewish issue. You want to be with the blood of Abraham in your veins? Like Etai from God. That's my fight. Those are my people. You got to show up. Show up to pro-Israel rallies and events. It's so important. Voice your opinions. Show your support. Do not be silent. Establish an Israel Action Committee in the church, in your groups. People that are dedicated to monitoring the situation going on in Israel. People that are very passionate about this, saying we want to organize a, a rally. We want to organize an event. We want to bring in speakers. We want to make sure that if there's something happening at the City Hall or, or on the streets of Austin or something that we don't like that we think is problematic, or something happens on the University of Texas campus or campuses around the country, we want to make sure that people know we don't agree with this, we don't like that, and we want to come out in full force. Speak with your fellow congregants, your friends and family, about the importance of supporting the Jewish people in Israel in this battle, I should have said a war, in this battle between good and evil. And also to learn about Faith of Friends, which is our platform here, and to get involved. So lastly, some points to ponder. Summary, as descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people are different. We're different. We're just not the same as everybody. We're just, we're just not. If we were, we'd be gone a long time ago. We're still here. And the nations of the world have a choice. They have a choice as to how to respond to that difference. How are we going to respond to that difference? Blessings are given to Abraham and his descendants as an eternal promise, but can only be actualized by the people's actions. The nations of the world can share in those blessings by connecting with the Jewish people. Once the connection is made and the blessings are shared, they must return those blessings to the people by their actions. Curses are given to those who stand against the Jewish people. Those individuals and nations lose their vitality and will fade away. Right? What did Hitler say? A thousand year Reich. Didn't work out. And the blessings are meant for all. That's the key. The blessings are meant for all. And anyone 
who connects with the Jewish people is a child of Abraham. So I hope that that has been, uh, I, I know that I, I probably went over there, but uh, I hope that that's been interesting for you to hear, to take Genesis 12, 3, and I always say, bless the Jewish people, and you know, those who bless you, I will bless, and curse you, I'll get. We, we all know it, right? We know it, I can wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, say, Genesis 12, 3, and you can say it like that, right? <laughs> After you call the cops, you could probably say it. <laughs> How did he get in? But uh, we're different. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but I hope that this has given an, your, an opportunity to look at the scripture, to break it apart. Who's talking to who? What is the nature of this anyway? What are my responsibilities in this thing we call life, wherein I want to connect with my creator, I want those blessings, I understand what is happening now to God's people, and I don't like it. I think it's wrong. And I think that there are many people in this world who are horribly misguided and doing a lot of damage, a lot of damage. And are we going to be the agents of change? Are we going to be the agents who fight on the side for good, for freedom, for justice, for truth, and for faith? Or are we going to sit back and let this happen because it doesn't involve us? I don't think anybody here in this room thinks that. And so here are some ways that we can get involved and we can work together as Jews and as Christians to actualize the blessings that God gave to Abraham and intended for all of us here. Thank you so much. So I guess we'll, uh, uh, with your uh, permission, take some good. Yes? Uh, I have a question, Rabbi Dan. Yes, sir. So I belong to what's called modern orthodoxy. Uh, as I mentioned Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. I encourage you all to, to look him up. Uh, rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch was a very important rabbi. Uh, his dates are about 1808 to 1888 in Germany and Frankfurt, and uh, believed in creating a kind of Judaism that was what he called uh, Torah in Derech Eretz, meaning that a Jew has to be, if the math works out here, 100% committed to their Judaism, to Torah, to the religious way of life, and 100% committed to their society, to their secular world, to enhancing uh, the culture around them, and to be, be, be contributors and builders. And so that's what modern orthodoxy was about. It was about marrying or bringing together these two different worlds, you know, taking the noblest aspects of the secular world, rejecting others, of course, not a, you, can, you don't take everything with you, but things like going to, in the modern orthodox world, for example, you go to yeshiva and you go to college. Okay? You go to, uh, if you're living in Israel, you go to the army and you go to seminary, you go to yeshiva. So you're, you're always living in these two worlds. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I became a chaplain was because that was, for me, a religious value. I'm living in the state of Texas, I'm gonna serve the state of Texas. That's a religious value, it's not like, I like TRICARE. So, <laughs> so we'll talk about that later. But, uh, but uh, so that's what, that's what modern orthodoxy is, okay? So it's bringing these together. And then of course within modern orthodoxy, as with all things, there are different sort of uh, perspectives on it. There are those that are a little bit more uh, progressive, there are those that are more conservative, lowercase c on that. And so it's a very wide, a very wide uh, spectrum, okay? So that's, that's modern orthodoxy. I would say, by and large, that yes, I think I, I can't speak for my friends in the other denominations of reform and conservative and you know, everything, uh, everything in between. I can't uh, speak for their experiences, but I do know that it has been very, very hard. Um, and Douglas Murray says this. Uh, he said that, um, he said he was speaking to a group, I think he was in London, he was speaking at a synagogue, and he said, I'm sure that all of you, you know, conservative, reform, Orthodox Jews and these differences are very important to you and they mean a lot to you and you spend time in them and, and it helps you define their identity and it means a lot to you. But it didn't mean a darn thing to the terrorists who showed up on October 7th. And so I think that regardless of where you fall in the Jewish world, I don't think that people on uh, the UC Berkeley campus or the Harvard campus or, um, or uh, you know, any of these other uh, places where uh, Columbia, 
Uh, those protesters don't care how religious you are or what shul, what synagogue you go to. They care that you're a Jew. And so I think that this moment has been unifying in the sense that it brought us all together as Jews and really broke down a lot of other barriers that are normally there that people fixate on. Uh, but of course, it's in moments of crisis and catastrophe that people are brought together, unfortunately. But so I can say that that feeling is shared throughout the Jewish denominations. Yeah. Is all clear? Good. I can go. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to ask if you might be able to share a story about how some of these influences have impacted your personal family. You know, at home, you're a father and a and a husband and your children have to be aware of these things. And, and maybe there's a story or something you could share that we could participate a little bit more. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, thank God, you know, I, I don't have a family in, that I'm aware of in, in Israel. I don't know, uh, I, I know of, of some congregants uh, and other people who have, of course, been directly impacted by this. Uh, and it's horrifying. Um, I don't have that direct experience. What I do have, experience of is, uh, I don't know if you remember, I, I, and I forget which month it was, where they wanted to do a day of rage. Um, is that in December? Or, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but my wife and I were speaking, we have, uh, we have three children, uh, a six-year-old, a, uh, a five-year-old, and, uh, and a two-year-old. And we were talking, do we send our children, they go to Jewish school, do we send our children to school that day? And we ultimately decided that we weren't gonna send them. And I was reflecting on this, that in 2024 in Austin, Texas, a Jewish family has to ask if they can send their children to Jewish school and choosing not to for fear that you won't see them again. That's the reality. That's the reality. Um, one other thing that I'll, I'll mention though, just to kind of go back to this, is uh, there's a house by our house where the guy flies an Israeli flag. <laughs> I was like, does anyone, does that, see here? Uh, I don't know, I don't know who he is. But he flies an Israeli flag. I don't know him, I don't know why. But I was driving home with my son, and my son was in the backseat of the car, and he goes, look dad, he likes us. Wow. Yeah. But that's the feeling, everyone hates us. He has an Israeli flag, he's a friend. So my children are growing up in this world. It's a world I did not grow up in. I was obviously wow. aware of certain things, but I never experienced, I never had to stay home because I was Jewish, because I thought somebody might, you know, my parents never had that conversation that my wife and I had. Um, and so my children are learning to be very careful uh, of, of things, to go out places. And, you know, we go everywhere with our kippah. Um, my wife is from Germany originally, and uh, she's saying nobody in Germany is going around with a kippah now. Out. They wear a, they wear a hat. Uh, they still cover their heads, but it's, it's sort of the norm. You don't do that. And to think that people have to walk around in 2024 Berlin, afraid of an acid attack or getting slashed or something because they're Jewish. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you're supposed to deal with that. If this was any other group, oh, well, in that case, you know, like in college campuses, we would, uh, we would uh, you know, uh, have big problems with that. Uh, if you think about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, congressional uh, testifying that was done by the three uh, presidents of uh, Harvard, MIT, and Penn, where they said it's calling for the genocide of Jews, hate speech, and they said, with all of the fancy letters behind their names, it depends on the context. It depends on the context, and you're the president of the most prestigious university in the country? My, uh, my kid's going to UT. I, I don't know what to tell you. So uh, it's very scary what's happening right now. My kids are, are picking up on this. Thank you. How do, we, how do we become more aware of uh, all of this that's going on? Because, I mean, I, I think certainly within our, or my perimeter of news and whatnot, I never hear things like this. Mm. So definitely to diversify, I mean, and that's true, whether, whatever side of the spectrum you're, you're, you're on on that, diversify your sources, I think is, is really important because, you know, echo chambers are, uh, they, they happen everywhere. Um, but I think starting to look at um, Israeli papers, Jewish papers, get them all online, uh, but also other reputable papers as well, Wall Street Journal, uh, things like that, that, that talk about these, uh, the, uh, these things and what's happening. 
Um, so some sources don't comment on them because they know it's a problem and they're not going to comment on them. Other sources <coughs> aren't going to speak vociferously about that, which is, which is good. Um, but yes, this is uh, a very real thing. And you know, so I think that, for example, what was happening on college campuses, uh, all you have to do is you know, Google or, or, or YouTube, you know, Columbia University, uh, you know, anti-Semitism or whatever, and bam, there you go. And it's very, very real. So I would just say, you know, whenever possible to you know, it, 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 if you're not hearing these things, I would go and, 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 and seek them out because they are they are there and readily available. Yeah. Can you just quickly name a couple of Jewish sources, websites that you would trust? Because it helped me when I had a Jewish friend say, Ynet. Ynet, yeah, so Ynet, 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 Ynet is good. Um, I would look at um, just, just Y and the net, N-E-T. Yeah, Ynet. Um, uh, Jewish, uh, uh, what's it called, the Jewish uh, Syndicate? JNS. Yeah, JNS, JNS uh, is, uh, is a, just type in JNS, a Jewish okay. National Syndicate. Um, and um, it, things like, you know, the Times of Israel and things like that is also good to, to have just to, to, to continue to be uh, aware of these things. Yeah. Would, would you say um, that maybe most of the Jewish people that you know, Rabbi Dan, feel that Christians are their friends, don't, or just simply don't know? I think they don't know because we haven't, we haven't heard. And I think people want to hear. And I think that there's a lot of people who want to do something, and that's what we're here to do. Say, you want to do something, here's how you do it. Let's create a platform where you can do something about that. So I think that people are, are wondering, where is all the, the, the support? Where's all the, the friends that we thought we had and you know, things like that? Um, and so I think that they, they don't know. And that's really why we're here, to, 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 to you know, dispel the mystery that you are here. It's real. Um, and so that's sort of the sense, uh, the sense that I, I get. breaks my heart but I, I as I've been checking out all of the news I, I live on a street one end is a Muslim couple the other end is a Jewish couple and in between there's us you know it's, it's quite the little crossroads um, my Muslim neighbor they're, they're very reasonable people they are not fanatics at all but some of the news things that they share they talked about for example the Lancet British Medical Journal just published a relief. They say that 186,000 Gazans have been killed. For uh, this seems to me a disproportional response, and I'm trying to figure out what I can say to my neighbor without forsaking my support yep. for Israel, which I have wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. What do I say to that? It seems like there's the Jews who are not living ethically, who are not living the way God wanted. I, I don't know. So the first thing is you have to ask where they got the numbers from. Yeah. Well, the Lancet Mo is... The most of those numbers are provided by Hamas. And my mother told me, don't trust a terrorist. No. So they inflate numbers. Okay. They inflate the numbers because they know that good people are going to be outraged by it. That's the first thing. Don't trust Hamas numbers, and people should be ashamed of themselves for using them on, on reputable uh, uh, news platforms and things like that. Uh, so those numbers are, are highly inflated. The second thing is ask yourself, why are those children there? Well, they're there not because Israel wants to kill children. The people who came into Israel want to kill children. Yeah. They want to rape women. Yes. They want to do that. Yeah. The soldiers of the IDF do not want to kill children. But you know who doesn't have a problem with that? Hamas. Yeah. That's right. And so what do they do? They take schools and hospitals and nurseries and mosques and they arm them and they make them targets mm -hmm. and they don't let the children leave and they don't let the women leave and they know that Israel is coming. Why? Israel tells them. They say, get out. We're going to do this. They drop the, the dummy bombs and all those things to get them out. They don't leave. Why? If they leave, first of all, Hamas is going to shoot them and say that Israel did it. Second of all, Hamas is using them. They think, they think maybe this is a good thing. Can you imagine 
your child saying, I hope that one day you get killed by an Israeli bullet so that I can, you know, get some credit with my society. No, nobody here thinks this way. Nobody here thinks this way, but they do. So I understand what they're saying, and if, you know, and that, that's horrible. Nobody wants the loss of any innocent life. But we have to look at the root of this. And the root of it is that Hamas is an evil regime that is using its own people to its benefit and they are winning the PR war because they know that good people are sympathetic when they hear about innocent children being killed. And so they're completely, completely whitewashing what happened on October 7th and that way they're able to focus on the campaign in Gaza. And if Hamas wanted, the war would end right now. Give back the hostages. And that's a question that I would ask your neighbor. Do you, would you, will you say that, it, that Hamas must return all the hostages? I will say that I think that these numbers are horrific if you will say to me that, I'm, that, that Hamas must release all of these hostages. I wonder what he would say. I have no doubt that he's a good man, that he's not, but you have to ask yourself a question. So again, when people talk about the numbers and things like that, you have to go a step further. Yeah. And you have to say, why is this happening? I was once asked a question um, by somebody, I was, I was doing a sort of a Israel education thing for a, a colleague of mine who's a chaplain in the uh, Wisconsin Air National Guard. He's an Episcopalian priest. I was talking about some Israel stuff he asked me to do. And um, one of the, the people asked, what could be done to achieve peace? What could be done to achieve peace? Well, you know, as somebody who is uh, thoroughly versed in you know, geopolitics, I, no. I, I said, look, it's very simple. It's very simple. The first thing that has to be done to achieve peace is you have to stop thinking these people want what you want. Stop it. They don't. What's your idea of peace? I give a little, you give a little, I live, I live with you, you live, I don't like you, but I'm not, you know, okay. Their idea of peace is you're dead. That's peace to them. So how are you going to achieve peace when the other side thinks that the only way to resolve the conflict is with your death? You don't achieve it that way. So we have to stop thinking like that. And they're using that against us. And I would say, when you said if they're, the Jewish people are acting morally, it is the Jewish people, it is the Israeli people's morality that is the constraint. That's right. It is the thing that is keeping from the end of all of this right now. It is because we will not go and just blow everything up. We will not do that. Israel will not do that. So it is the morality of the IDF that is actually prolonging this. I'm sure people would disagree with me on that, but if you think about what's going on here, that's what's going on. Um, other thoughts? Yes. I'm not an activist. I'm not, gonna, I'm not one either. of those people who are going <laughs> to you know, protest. I, I'm just not. And, and, you know, but I have many Jewish friends whom I love and I care about. How can I express my love for them as individuals? and support them in this place where they're being maligned. Yeah, so I think, look, I, I think it's important to always stress to if you have Jewish friends and uh, friends that are Israeli, you know, that you do support them. I think that that's really important for people to hear. You know, it's not just about going to rallies and, and getting yelled at at, you know, uh, events. That's, part of it, but a big part of it is making connections with other people and letting them know that you care about them. Uh, and that's, that's really important. Um, and I would say that in any way that it can be done to help them, and if they say, you know, there's an organization I think you should take a look at, or, you know, whatever it is, okay, maybe I'll get involved in that, maybe I'll give to this, maybe I'll give to that, right? You don't have to create a revolution to make a giant difference in somebody's life. Right, so you can talk about it on big picture levels, but also on the micro levels where you are making a difference, where you just let somebody know, like, hey, I heard this is going on in Israel right now. Is your family okay? Do you have family in Israel? Checking in with people like that makes a big difference. Why? Because it lets them know that you care about them. Uh, that's the biggest difference. So certainly, that's a way to do it. Yeah, no? Oh, again, it's not only what's going on in Israel. It's going on in our own country. Yeah. yeah. The BDS movement. Is ridiculous. Yeah. There, uh, I read today where uh, some of the European institutions, scientific, want to cut off joint funding with Israel. Uh, that hurts us all. The the 
things that happen through international cooperation in the scientific community mm -hmm. benefit everybody. That's right. With medical advances and technological <coughs> advances. Mm -hmm. advances. Uh, BDS potentially would cut off businesses for Israel. <coughs> for, uh, we have we have all the children who are on uh, campuses, one of whom happens to be in a graduate uh, program at Columbia. She has got to be very careful. She's not on the main campus, but there's incidences in her department where uh, there's you know, support for the BDS movement and the pro-Palestinian uh, uh, terrorists. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that you know, Israel would like peace, but there's not one Palestinian leader who's ever agreed to peace with Israel and not the total eradication of the Jewish people. Right, right, and, and, that's, and that's talking about peace. You know, when a person says from the river to the sea, that's not like a metaphor. That's, they, they want the one state solution, which means no Jews, Judenrein. What does that mean? You people actually say the Jews should go back to Poland and Germany. Do you have any concept of history? None. <clears throat> they have no concept of history. And if you want me to prove to you that that would be the case, all you have to do is look at 2005 and the Israeli pullout from Gaza. Not one Jew was allowed to remain. Why? Because the Palestinian state could not have one Jew. Could not have it. So you want to tell me, again, you know, this is opening up another box with anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, it's the same thing. Same thing, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. How do you reach then, the kids on, on campus at Columbia or elsewhere, especially if some of them are Jewish, which I heard there are some of them are Jewish. Sure. Sure. So, so unfortunately, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the education system as a whole, which is a very long and deep rabbit hole. Uh, I think the professors and where the money is coming from and all of these things are making it difficult for people to speak um, moral clarity. Not that that's necessarily the job in the university. The job of the university is to challenge students. They're not challenging students. They're saying, this is what I want you to think. If you think something else, then you get an F. That's not good. Uh, and so I think a lot of it has to do with where the funding is coming from for the curriculum, uh, who these professors are. Uh, if you take a look at what, what, what happened uh, at the, uh, at the um, uh, the uh, testimonies that were that were given uh, by by Harvard and, and Columbia and uh, and MIT and Penn, it's very disturbing. So I think that the, you have the students, but I think the bigger picture is what's going on with the teachers, with the professors, with the administration that's pumping this into the culture and kind of let it go. Now you talked about what about Jews doing it? Yeah, and I'm, I'm yeah. really thinking about the individuals, you know, the ones that the kid comes up and gets in your place, Christian or Jew, and and just doesn't agree with that. I mean, how do you reach them? Well, fact is a fact. I mean, I, right. I, but so, so some people you can't reach, and you got to cut your losses. The, 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 the point, though, is don't give that guy any job involving any responsibility. <laughs> it's like the person at, at, at NYU who was like the head of the Student uh, Law Association who starts tweeting out these pro-Hamas things and then the Chicago law firm that was gonna hire her says no thanks. And she's like, why, that's, that's a discrimination. No, it's not, it's a law firm. We don't want people that are okay with rape and decapitation to be in our law firm. Why is that crazy? You wrote it, right? So I think, I think it's also putting responsibility on the students as well. You know, that if you choose, this is not the 1960s. We will find you if you were at a protest. If you were at, we figure out who you are, and then that information will be shared. So it, that's not that's not a threat. That's just saying be responsible for your actions. Uh, then, in terms of Jews doing this kind of thing, look, anti-Semites love more than anything a Jew who's going to go along with their program. Why? Because it gives them the credibility that they need to say, look, well, he's Jewish and he agrees with it. It's like I don't care if that guy's Jewish and he agrees with it. He's, he's, he's totally outside of the box, you know. Um, look, I'll say it like this. The story of Abraham, every Abraham has a lot. <laughs> Those people are lots. They can't live with you. They look like you. They choose things you wouldn't choose. And they end up getting eaten up by the same system that they left you for. That's lot. That's those people. Well, I know that we're, we're way over time here. I want to thank you. I'm going to be around. Uh, so I think Pastor Matt, 
wants to uh, close us out here. But thank you all so much again for being here, for listening to me. And uh, if you have questions for me later, I'll be around about Friends of Faith. I'll be around. Thank you all so much for being here. Just <laughs>
in order to be true to the God they love and who has called them. This feels to me to be not at all easy. And so for the suffering that they feel attempting to do this, I pray, Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, help them. Amen. Yes. Draw near to them and lift up their countenances to you. Amen. Give them every grace and every strength. Amen. Just continue to live this calling. Amen. And I, I certainly pray that they would know that we too, we Christians, have been named in one of our books in the New Testament as strangers and aliens. Mm -hmm. so, so let them know more and more and more and more that we are also with them. Keep them, keep them as the apple of your eye. Amen. Amen. I want to pray out of a common scripture that we share. I love this concept that Rabbi Dan talked. It reminded us that blessed do grafting. I think that's did I understand that correctly? Did I miss that? Yeah. Uh, this is. <coughs> This may be a Pope Chapel thing. I exempt everyone from it that feels uncomfortable. <laughs> but this grafting, could, if, if there's, I don't know who else here, but there's maybe a symbolic either taking of a hand or a hand on the shoulder to demonstrate something, or holding hands up. And I'd like to pray out of the songs on, on your congregation. And we want it to come through you to us. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make his face shine upon us. That your ways may be known on the earth and your saving power among the nations. Let the people's praise be <coughs> that all the people's praise let the nations rejoice and sing for joy. Yes. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations on the earth. Amen. Let the peoples praise you. Amen. Let all the peoples praise you. Yes. For the earth is yielded its harvest, and God, our God, shall bless us. He shall bless us, and the ends of the earth. Yes, Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening thanking you for, uh, for this night and this opportunity to hear uh, from Rabbi Dan um, and we lift up uh, the faith of friends unto you, Father. Uh, we pray uh, that you would bring forth every bit of wisdom needed, um, every resource needed. Uh, we pray for favor. Uh, let your favor rest upon Rabbi Dan and, and all the, the Christians um, partnering um, with him, Father, um, and uh, that you would establish uh, the work of our hands. Yes, O oh Lord, establish uh, the work of our hands. Uh, we pray, Father, uh, that you would make way for a deeper Jewish, Christ, Jewish and Christian connection here in the city of Austin, um, that you would make ways uh, within the churches in Austin, uh, within pastoral leadership um, here in the city of Austin um, for further connections, further conversations, uh, that advocacy um, could, could spring up from the ground um, here in Austin um, to be a mutual benefit um, to, to our Jewish brothers and sisters and as well that it will be a blessing then um, to, to us as Christians as well. And we um, entrust this into your hands. Um, we pray in your wonderful Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to pray real quick, and then also I ask Rabbi Dan if you wouldn't mind blessing Pope Chapel. Uh, but I'm going to read a bit from Titus chapter 3. Uh, this will be where I'll be praying from. Um, it says, 
this is what Paul wrote, wrote to Titus. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And that's the part I said I identify with. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Amen. So, Lord, have mercy on us. I lift up before you everyone who walks in hatred and in darkness, hating and being hated, with particular attention to our Jewish friends, the Palestinian conundrum, or what do you call it? I don't know. The, the conflict in the Middle East, but also conflict with, between people of different faiths. Um, the hatred that consumes us, that is, feels more powerful than we can oppose. Lord, have mercy on us. Yes. Pour out your mercy abundantly yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Rabbi Dan, you can close us with a prayer. Okay. <clears throat> I want to bless all of you this evening for coming and for showing that you are putting the courage of your convictions into action this night. And it's heartening to see so many people that care and that understand the truth of God's ways. And in this way, I'd like to bless Pastor Matt. I'd like to bless all of you, all of those at Friends of Faith, and I'd like to bless this chapel. It was said of Abraham. Abraham was known for having a wide open tent. And all who wanted to had to merely come by, and it would be hosted by Abraham. And it is said that as God is speaking to Abraham, Abraham interrupts God when he sees three men standing at the entrance of his tent. And to interrupt God <laughs> to address the needs of three people is outstanding. And it's astounding. But that's what we're doing. We all know God's plan for us. It will always be there. It exists. But our job in this tent right now is to greet the people that are standing at the entrance and to bring them in. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Uh, speaking of the AC being burned, there were over at the max, over 100 people here. Um, the original RSVPs were around 38, 40, so. <laughs> I hope you do feel loved. Um, go in peace love and serve the Lord. We'll get the chairs. You can mill about. You don't have to worry about the chairs. And Rabbi Dan said he'd be here for a little bit longer. Thank you for coming.